Hi, back again with Chapter 5. Um, this is going to be a kind of head down and running version of that. One of the things I want to make sure you know, um, on the Chapter Notes button on Blackboard, there is a link to the um, student resources for the book. Um, the actual web links for Chapter 5 are amazing and great fun, so go, go look at those as, as well. Um, a couple of things in Chapter 5 I want to really pay attention to so you know the differences and kind of how they work, and then I'm going to leave the rest of that up to you. Um, chapter 5 is Fallacies and Persuaders. Um, two sets of two different kinds of fallacies. Some are irrelevant premises, others are unacceptable. And then the last part of the chapter is all about rhetorical moves. Um, in this chapter, we have 33 vocabulary words. Okay, obviously not all of those are going to end up on the test. Um, and we have three crucial sentences, no big words. Okay, so that's kind of how these guys wrap out. Chapters four and five are not difficult, but there's a lot of information. Um, so I put them together for one test and then we kind of move on. Um, one thing, okay, I'm going to go through a couple of things here. Um, there's a list of definitions, kind of short and sweet definitions, for the um, irrelevant premises on page 169. There's a list, same kind of list, for unacceptable premises on page 175. This is all in the 5th edition book. Um, if you have a 4th edition book, you can still use it, but the page numbers are going to be wrong, so just keep looking. Um, irrelevant premises are those fallacies that are distractions more than anything else. And we have these fallacies, okay? There are lots of ways we can mess up an argument. Okay, um, we've all seen those, read those, done those that didn't turn out in our favor very well. But there are lots of ways that keep getting used over and over and over again, so much so that we've developed names for them and kind of ways to look out for them. And that's really what this chapter is mostly about, kind of calling our attention to ways that folks who are doing the argument can kind of throw up things in our way that we get distracted with or that don't really actually help their argument. Um, but they seem to, okay? So, the first set of fallacies is all a bunch of distractions. They're irrelevant. They really don't add to or even pertain to that particular argument, but they get used so that we'll pay attention to something else and not pay attention to the argument as itself. Um, one of the things, I'm making sure I'm on the right page here, um, a few things that we end up having a lot of, we see a lot of, and they give us a lot of trouble. Um, one is called a genetic fallacy, and it has nothing to do with kind of genes and such, but it really means we disregard something because of where it comes from. Who said it? What's their political leaning? What's their ethical leaning? How do they... And Maimonides is right. We need to accept truth, actual truth, from wherever it comes. Um, just because we don't like the person it's himself or herself, um, just because we don't agree with their stance on certain things, doesn't mean they can't say true things. Okay? Um, there are lots of really bad examples for that. Um, the other side of that is we can't just accept the truth because of where it comes from. Um, just because your favorite author says something doesn't make it necessarily true. Okay, so we have to be careful to actually judge each of these claims on their own merit. Okay. Um, another set that we get in, we get confused with um, a composition fallacy versus a division fallacy. A composition fallacy says what's true of the parts has to be true of the whole. Um, and that's not always the case. Um, my favorite one from the book is um, atoms, A-T-O-M-S, atoms are invisible. Therefore, anything that's made up of atoms should be invisible. Well, okay, that doesn't work. Everything's made up of atoms. We can see a lot of it, so not so much. Division says what is, part, what is true of the whole also has to be true of the parts. Um, and this is how we get um, all kinds of prejudice um, worked in there. Just because something is true of a particular group, doesn't necessarily mean it's true of every individual in that group, okay? Um, and think about, you know, the kind of war between the sexes. Just because, as a whole, women tend to be better nurturers than men, doesn't mean that a man can't be a good nurturer. 
doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean that this particular woman is a better nurturer than anybody else. Okay? We're making global statements. You have to be very careful about that to begin with. Um, another one is called equivocation. And basically, that's when we use the same word twice in an argument, but it means two different things. Okay? And you see the, the book has some really interesting ones there that will make your hair catch on fire. Um, a red herring is a glaring emotional distraction. Okay? Um, and it comes from training hunting dogs. Um, you know, everything's about the smell. And if they can follow a scent, even when a red herring, which is a really stinky fish, is drawn across their particular scent line, they still stay with the true one. They're trained. If not, we got to try again. Um, the last one I think is really important um, is called the straw man. And really what a straw man argument is, um, is when we oversimplify somebody else's argument so that we can tear it apart easier. Okay? We pull it down to just one piece instead of the complexity that it has and then pick on that piece because it's easy. Okay. Um, the other side of this, the unacceptable premises are, they have bearing. Okay? They're not just distractions, but they're still pretty dubious. Most of the time these happen when the argument itself has trouble and so we're trying to kind of distract a little bit. Um, a few of the dubious ones, begging the question, which we use as a term of time and we don't really mean it the way it's supposed to be meant. It's another one of those, in the outside world we do this. In logic class, and critical thinking class, we do this. Um, begging the question is using the conclusion as one of my premises. Okay, and you think, well, how would we, how would we manage to get away with that? Well, we have a lot of premises. Okay? And so we're using that, that one um, premise is also our conclusion. Not valid, not structurally sound, so we have to go on from there. Um, a false dilemma, we give two choices when there's really a whole bunch. Um, think about, okay, the last election. You can either vote for Secretary Clinton or you can vote for Mr. Trump. Well, there were lots of other folks on the ballot as well. Okay, it's a false dilemma. Um, a slippery slope, basically saying if we take this first little step, <coughs> excuse me, that eventually and inevitably we're going to end up basically down at the bottom of the hill. Um, disaster will ensue. Um, a hasty generalization, we've seen this already in Chapter 2. We're going to see it again um, in Chapter 8. But a hasty generalization is making a conclusion from too small of a sample. Um, I asked the students in my room, okay, so eight folks, what JCC students think about X? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm making a hasty generalization because my class is very small and because there are a lot of JCC students. Not to mention that my sample, my eight folks, um, seven guys, one girl, um, match very not so much um, the demographics of our um, total JCC population. So we have to be careful when we make decisions based on a small sample that it's not too small. Okay. The last one is a faulty analogy. An analogy is just um, a comparison between two things that are similar. Well, maybe those two things are similar but not in ways that matter for this particular argument. We call that a faulty analogy. There are lots more. Um, look at your page numbers. 169 and 175 um, for the, the quick um, definitions and then Dr. Vaughn goes into detail about all of these and gives some really good examples. Okay, The examples are going to be important for the test. Now the last piece of this chapter is also this idea of persuaders and it's not persuaders for a good cause. Um, it's not logical persuaders. These are rhetorically emotional persuaders, okay? We have distractions, dubious, we have emotionalism, okay? And there are a few things here, and I just, I spelled that one wrong. I know it has two ends in it. I'll just mess that up. I'm going to make it fix. Okay. Innuendo is saying one thing, but implying something else, okay? Um, and usually that something else is very negative. 
a euphemism and a dysphemism are basically opposite sides of the same coin. A euphemism is a positive connotation of a word used to kind of hide or gloss over a negative or even just a normal um, kind of connotation. When we're thinking about a euphemism, um, the first thing that usually comes to mind is um, what we name body parts, especially what adults consider embarrassing body parts when we're talking to little kids. Um, there's a trend against that now, and I think that's great. But euphemisms are things we use to kind of gloss over the truth. Dysphemisms have the opposite effect. They are negative connotations used to kind of sway away from kind of neutral or positive ones. Um, calling somebody, I don't know, a cow, um, when really we should be calling them, okay, who they really are, okay? People and cows are not the same thing. Um, but we're, we're trying to put a negative spin on something. Um, again, we've talked about stereotyping back in Chapter 2. When we're talking about stereotyping, we're talking about making these assumptions about a group of people based on some not well thought out description. Ridicule, we're making fun of somebody, not in a good way. Um, and then we have rhetorical definitions that tend to sway us emotionally when definitions should help us get a better understanding of the word, not so much cover it up, and that's what this does. So in chapter five, we're really looking at how we tend to get um, made over, duped, that kind of thing, um, by the way people talk and the way they put out information as if it's supposed to matter in our argument. And we have to be careful about those things. In chapter five, these fallacies, they happen so often that we, we have names for them, okay? Um, but they still get used. And you can probably watch the next couple of minutes of commercials and find half a dozen, okay? That's just how things work. Um, the acceptable premise, unacceptable premises, things that are dubious, okay? They don't really help the argument, but they make us doubt whether we're right, okay, in, in the long run. Um, this is chapter five. I know it's a very quick outline of chapter five, um, but really what you're reading in chapter five is a lot of definitions and a lot of examples. Um, and so go through and do those. Go look at that, um, the fallacy detective stuff. Um, it sounds kind of lame, but it's actually kind of fun. Um, have, a, have a look at that and see how that goes for you. Um, again, uh, chapter summary, exercises, make sure you ask questions if you have them. Okay. Chapter four and five will have their own tests together. Um, and so that will be coming up shortly. Okay. So happy day. Thanks for watching.